What the customer was looking for was a package system to produce 44,000 pounds an hour, which is 20 tons of steam, European standard, that he could have built in the US, take to Murmansk, Russia, install it, hook it up, bolt it together, and not have to build a building, not have to get the permitting. Apparently the permitting over there is a big, big issue with building, getting the building permit. So he needed a system that produced this kind of steam, uh, 100 pound operating to fire on um, mazout, which is a nasty number six oil. From what we look at in the US, it's, it's, it's rough. It's a pretty nasty stuff to, to burn. And he needed something that, again, they, that we could build in containers here, uh, test, do a full, full fire test here in the US, unbolt it, put it on trucks, go to ships, take it to Russia, they could take it to the job site, bolt it back together, fire it up, and let it go. We were, um, we negotiated from August through the first part of November on the design, the, the pricing, all the intricacies of, of putting this thing together. Uh, the first week of, of November, we, were, we finally uh, signed uh, the deal and uh, received the down payment. We ordered the equipment. Um, we started building everything the middle of February, uh, and then we had to ship everything the first week of May. So that meant we had to build all these containers, uh, put spray-on insulation, piping, put all the equipment in there, uh, bolt it all up in our shop. Uh, hook it up, go through all the electrical checks, test fire everything, do a full fire test for the customer. They flew the guys in from Russia to do the to witness a full fire test in our shop. And that took place the third week of April. Uh, and then the first week of, of May, we shipped the equipment out. Broke it all down, took all the interconnecting pieces, labeled them all, put them all on pallets, put those in the containers. The other issue we had, we had, you know, we have stacks on top of the containers uh, for the exhaust stack from each boiler had to go out. And then we had the steam headers, we had to put those through the roof of each container and build a manifold system for all the steam headers to tie into. And all of that had to be built where we could unbolt it, strap it down to pallets, put it inside the containers because everything had to be shipped again in those four containers. Um, one other thing, when we, when we designed the cutouts in the containers, we designed it to where we had a, a 10 foot walkway. So when you came in the side of, of, you know, you got one, two, three, four containers, you came in the, the side of container one, you opened it up, you had a 10 foot wide walkway, clear walkway, all the way through two, three, and four. When you walked into container one, of course your feed system, mazout heating system, two pieces of water softener, they're in container one. Uh, go into container two, the other two pieces of the water softener, and uh, boiler number one. Container three had all the electrical switch gear, uh, all the control mechanisms there in the front, and then boiler number two. In container four was boiler number three, blow down separator, air compressor for, uh, for light off. When they lit, light these things off, they have to light them off on, on number two fuel oil because they have no steam to heat their mazout, so they have to light them off on number two. No steam for no steam pressure for atomizing for atomizing the fuel, so we had to have an air compressor. Tie that into boiler number three. That's the one that we fire up when we get up to steam pressure. We have a main connection off the off the header up on the roof that came into uh, container number one for the preheat steam for the feed system and the mazout oil. Once we got the mazout oil steam heater going and got the mazout up and, and running the way we needed it, got it circulating, all the lines hot, then we'd switch over from uh, uh, the air compressor over to steam atomizing and go from number two to mazout oil to, to start firing on oil. We had to design all of this uh, before we um, took the order on the project, and it wasn't like he came, with, came to us with an RFQ, an RFP, he didn't. He came to us with an idea, he said, okay, I need 20 tons of steam, here's what I need to burn, uh, here's how much water I've got, here's how much steam pressure, design a system for me in three, four, five, six containers, whatever it takes to put it together. We had um, 15 different designs of, you know, going to use two boards, going to use five boards, going to use, you know, 
a bunch of different things before we finally settled on, okay, the most economical is four containers, uh, three boilers, and a lot of that was based on freight. The freight cost to get the ex one extra container over there just blows the job completely out of the water. The freight from here to uh, Murmansk, Russia is, is extremely expensive. Um, so that was one other thing we had to deal with. The design, the boiler design itself came from our experience with building temp units for our rental fleet. Um, and we have, in conjunction with York Shipley, designed and it's evolved over the years. Um, units now that we can go up to 900 horsepower and put them in a 57 foot semi trailer. So we use that configuration and what, what we do there, we build the boiler so big that there's nothing on the side of the boiler. It's slick. There's, you know, there's no piping, no controls, nothing. Um, the blowdowns are all in the rear of the boiler on, on our temp units and all the controls are on the front. These particular units, because we didn't want them opening those big swing back doors uh, to get in there to blow the boilers down, we actually brought all the blowdown piping and blowdown valves to the front of the boiler. So when they're in there doing the operations uh, and they're checking things and checking water samples and TDS and doing the other things they do on a daily basis, they can also blow the boilers down without ever having to go back outside. So all the blowdown valves are under the front of the burner, um, all the fuel trains, the oil trains, the fuel pumps, everything is under the front of the burners, the water columns. Uh, we, we actually took the uh, control Christmas tree, we call it, which has the operating limits, the high limit, uh, the, the uh, operating pressure, the proportional pressure control. We took all of those off of the boiler because of issues we were afraid of having in vibration and shipment over there. We took those off the boiler, mounted them on the wall, and put a flex connector between those and the boiler so that all those were sitting on the wall, a lot easier to get to, access, just, just all the different things. Modulating feed valve assembly, because each boiler is the feed water, they're, they're fed by a common feed water line to all three boilers off the main feed pumps under the tank. So we had to have modulating feed valves on the boilers. Same issue, no place on the boiler to mount it, can't get to the sides of the boilers. So we've mounted them on, on the wall right under the uh, control um, Christmas tree we put on there. Uh, so that, that's, and that's where that design came from, was our experience in, in the rental industry and what we have built for our rental fleet. A lot of different things that we had to deal with. Um, one was the temperature. Uh, on site there in my months, they're looking at minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that was a big issue. I didn't have room in the containers to put secondary walls in to add insulation. Uh, the boilers that I put in there, the 550 horsepower York Shipley boilers, uh, three of those units in containers two, three, and four that took up the entire container. I had an inch of clearance on each side of the boiler so there was no room for insulation. So we came up with a, um, a spray-on insulation that give them 100 mils of insulation as far as thickness is concerned that would give them the same R values, R26 insulation. insulation. So that gave them a 55 degree delta uh, across the wall of that container regardless of what the outside temperature was and that allowed us to use that spray-on insulation. We sprayed um, 80 mils outside, 20 mils inside. We had to spray the floors under the floor. We had to spray the roof of the containers, the ends, the walls. The entire container had to be sprayed. Um, one of the, the other big issues was once, you know, we take these four containers and you line them up like this, 40 foot long container, eight feet wide, nine and a half feet tall and you line those up this way, then we had to build the container system, cut the interior walls out where it, when you walked inside, it looked like an open boiler room. Uh, so we had to cut the walls of the containers out. With these overseas shipping containers, these Connex containers, when you cut the wall out, that's all the strength of the container. That's what keeps the container from folding up like an accordion. So then we had to design uh, support steel around that opening, across the roof, um, under the roof. Couldn't do anything on the outside of the container because again, when it goes on over the ocean, you can't have anything sticking out. I mean, not even a quarter of an inch. Everything has to be flush with the outside wall. So we had to design these to where when 
the unit was complete and we had these 550 horsepower boilers in there and they picked those containers up from the ends, they don't pick them up in the middle, but from the ends that we didn't have this going on, we didn't have flexing going on, we didn't have, um, you know, the container was stable. So we, we designed the support structure, then we hired a structural engineer, he came in and looked at it and said um, something we didn't take into account, uh, you've got it too stiff. It has to be able to give. If it doesn't give, then all the pressure goes to one point, you will break the container in two. So he had us back off of the support steel we were putting in the containers. Just, just one of the things we had to deal with. In container one, it had the mazout heating system. So we had, a, had to design a heating system to heat the mazout oil from 80 degrees Fahrenheit to 220 degrees uh, to, to where it would be thin enough and the viscosity where it needs to be to, to fire in the boards. Then we had to have a full size water softener and because of the size of the units and the size of the softeners we had to go with a triplex unit. We had to have three uh, resin systems and one brine tank in order to get the size of those tanks down small enough to fit it in that nine and a half foot tall container. So we had to split that up. Now, it didn't have enough room in container one. Container one had the mazout heating system, the feed water system, two parts of the water softener, and then in the front of container two, the other two pieces of water softener. Um, lots of other things we did in there. We had um, a sampling station in there where they could sample uh, TDS in the, in the boilers. They had, we had chemical systems in there. All of that was in container one. So we ran lines from each boiler all the way to container one where they could test the, the water in those boilers, they could test the water in the feed water system all from a central location. Chemical same way, all the chemical pumps were in, in container one. So we had to run stainless steel chemical lines to each boiler through the containers. The other issue that they had to deal with and figure out was okay, when, when we pipe all this up, we have all this interconnected piping. Oil lines from container one going to container two, three, and four. Uh, feed water lines from from container one going to two, three, and four. Preheat steam lines coming in from, from somewhere to feed, the feed, to feed the feed water system. How are we gonna do that? So we, we designed the, the connections to where uh, between the containers, we put a 12-inch uh, long stainless steel flexible connection so that they didn't have to worry about marrying those um, flanges up face to face. That way we could, they could leave that we leave that 12 inches long there, that 12 inch space, they take that flexible connection, snake it in there, give them some room. So the containers didn't have to be perfect um, because in Russia, it, it's not gonna be. I mean, they, they were gonna put this thing on concrete blocks. One other item we were dealing with to go along with the, the, the cooling of the units or the heating of the units was the cooling of the units. Summer times are hot. Uh, we've got three boilers in there operating the feed water system, even though it's insulated, it's still drink, generating a lot of heat. Um, so we had to design louvered, uh, actuated louvers uh, for makeup air and for cooling air, and then put big exhaust fans in the unit to suck air through and, and just get the, you know, I sized them for um, uh, air change every two and a half minutes uh, so we can get a lot of air through those units. And that's the type of, of thing we did. Uh, again, just another thing we had to add to them on the louvers for the combustion air, they they're, uh, have actuators on them so that they don't stay open all the time. You leave them open all the time in the winter time, if they're not running, you're sucking all that cold air and you can freeze everything up. So the only time they open is when the boiler calls for steam and when that limit circuit trips, it opens the uh, actuators up so when the, when the blower comes on, you've got fresh air already coming in for it. When it shuts off likewise, it shuts the louvers back off. Again, just things that had to be taken into account because we were dealing with minus 20 degrees, you know, six feet of snow in Murmansk, Russia. And if you ever look up Murmansk, it's right at the bottom corner of Siberia. So it's getting up there in some pretty cold area. We shipped the equipment over there. They installed it. Um, it took them um, six months to get permits to get it into the place. Um, if, if you've never dealt in Russia, it, it's a different animal. Um, you have to pay everybody to get anything done. That's just part of what, what they do over there. Um, and then once they got it in place, they uh, took them another year to get a permit to actually test fire the unit. Um, once they started test firing, they were having some technical issues. So myself and one other guy went over there, spent a week there going through and, and showing them what, 
what they were doing wrong, what they needed to work on, and get the system operating for them. Um, the end user, he'd been buying steam. He didn't have a steam plant at all. And the people he, were buying, he was buying steam from, which is what generated this entire project, were jacking his steam rates up astronomically, you know, four, five, six times what he'd been paying for them, you know, just because he could. And so he said, I, I can fix this, I can put my own system in. So he, we put this system in and it was saving him you know, a couple hundred grand a month uh, in, in, in cost. And, and that was counting his operating cost and fuel cost versus what he was paying for steam before. Uh, so it was a very lucrative uh, project for him and that plan, it, it meant a lot to their bottom line.